Hello everybody and welcome to the Microsoft Data and AI South Florida. My name is Adriano da Silva, your host, and today we have here beside me Matt Gordon. He's, Greetings. He is our distinguished guest and presenter today. He will be talking about AI, interactive AI with Azure Cognitive Services, dialogue with data. So we will have an opportunity to learn about not only cognitive services, but also how to best use the product along with data, leveraging data here. So let's, uh... so Matt, tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, so I, uh, I've been in consulting for about five years. Um, I was a DBA for a long time before that, so it might strike some people as odd that I'm here speaking about AI and cognitive services coolness, but there's a lot for data professionals. There's a lot of stuff in here that, that I feel like we should know. Um, it can help you at work, and some of it's just kind of cool. Um, and so, yeah, so I built this talk to, to kind of get data people interested in, in the a AI side of the world. All right, from DBA to now, including some uh, Azure Cognitive Services, that's quite interesting. That's very cool. And uh, also level up your skill sets in the process. Yes, yeah, that all, I will mention that several times that, you know, it's always good to bring more to the table, whether you're happy where you are now and just want to bring more value there, or whether you want to move on from where you're at and you want to expand those skill sets. Um, you know, saying, especially even though buzzwords are annoying, AI is a buzzword. And if you're able to bring some of those skills to the table, or at least mention them on a resume in an interview, something like that, you're going to be farther ahead even in the data world than somebody that doesn't. Awesome. And uh, why don't you tell us now a bit uh, about the presentation, just a short bit. I know that as you introduce the presentation, you'll probably cover more in depth, but just kind of a highlight of what we're going to be looking at. So it's really, it's kind of a fast paced tour with what I think is cool about the cognitive services language API and we'll do demos and we'll kind of progressively work up to I don't want to write any code but I still want to play with this stuff to the demo at the end that's actually going to show some code in the hopes that you realize that code's not scary um, and that however you want to interact with these things um, there's ways to do it without writing a line of code there's ways to do it with writing some code there's ways to do it with writing a lot you know hopefully it kind of meets you where you're at um, and again whoever's here whether you're a data pro DBA Report dev, app dev, whatever, there's probably going to be something in here for you. And hopefully it plants that seed that this stuff is cool. Because, you know, what it's not is a deep dive into here's every exhausting bit about how this works. It's I want people to walk away and say, oh, that's pretty cool. I want to go play with that and see what I can do with it. So Awesome. So it sounds like we'll be a very applied presentation where the demos will allow us, the audience, to not only learn about the product, but also have a pathway on which to follow to engage with the product. Yeah, uh, you know, that's the one thing that I feel like marketing kind of undersells about this stuff is that you don't have to be, like, for instance, a C-sharp dev or a Python dev to use this stuff. Uh, for a lot of it, you can just go to a website and use it so yeah the demos kind of work work us up to that um, and hopefully you walk away where wherever your skill sets might be you're like well i can go play with that because i know how to do that um and yeah there's stuff you could take out of here and and there's especially one demo that i think if you're a dba or anywhere in it you could take that demo out of here right now plug it into something slightly different than what i did and use it tomorrow awesome so Let's dive into it. It's all you now, Matt. Please go ahead. All right. So let's get the screen shared. And then just let's make sure. Uh, let's make sure you can see it. So can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Awesome. Okay. 
so we've already kind of set this up, but one thing I do want to show you is at the bottom of the screen here, there's actually cognitive services at work. So even if you think the rest of the talk is boring and you don't want to play with any of the cool stuff I show you, subtitles in PowerPoint basically use those. Um, so that's, and you'll note they're fairly accurate. You'll also note, and I hope not to demonstrate this tonight, that if you swear, it will kind of, it will fuzz that out. So it won't actually transcribe swear words in case you wanted to leave this talk and go play with that right now. Uh, but like I said, hopefully we won't see a live demo of me swearing because it means something's gone sideways. So uh, let's learn a little bit more about me and how to contact me because a lot of times what ha happens is and I really enjoy talking about this stuff in person because a lot of times there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of people who are like, well, can you do this with it? Or I saw somebody do this with it. Uh, so, so I want that to happen here as well. So here are the ways to find me. I'm SQL at speed everywhere online. Um, I would say, so this slide is my current contact information. Uh, that contact information will be changing in about 10 days. So the best way to contact me is actually through my website and that's matt at sql at speed.com or just DMs on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn as well. So kind of wherever you want to go, but that inside address will still work for about 10 days more. Um, so you didn't come here to learn about me, but I do want to take a second and talk about groups like this. So as, as the bottom bullet point says, I run our pass local group here where I've lived for the last 15 years now. Um, you know, I, I know that this, I say this, whether I'm at a strict pass event or just a community event or whatever, but I mean, this year's obviously been challenging for everybody. The fact that you're here trying to learn more stuff is awesome stay plugged into this group and any other groups that you're a part of. Um, you know, it's nice to see and talk to people at a time where we're not supposed to be doing a lot of that. It, it's nice to do it this way. Um, you know, the, the worst case from being more involved in groups like this is you're going to learn some stuff you don't know. The best case about being involved in groups like this is you're going to learn that stuff. You're going to network with somebody that may plug you into your next job. Um, you know, I, I can honestly say that I started going to pass events seven years ago and a lot of the date events I've gone to, uh, they've opened so many doors for me. It's honestly changed my life. So stay plugged into this stuff, you know, volunteer to help however you can. Uh, it really does help people, including you. So like I mentioned, I'm SQL at speed everywhere online. It's a good excuse to show this slide. And hopefully that kind of burns in that if you come up with a question two days from now and you're like, oh, I want to talk to that Matt guy, but I can't remember his email. Um, like I said, website, Twitter, LinkedIn, SQL at speed, uh, blog, SQL at speed.com and email is Matt at SQL at speed. These are, I get to drive these cars once in a while. The five car is my current ride. Uh, so if you get to the end, you're like cognitive services, it, isn't for me, but I want to talk fast cars. I love to do that too. It's about the only thing I like to talk about more than this, but that's enough about me for sure. Uh, let's go through kind of how we're going to walk through the, the next few minutes here. So it's interesting to give this talk at non, you know, at data type events or app dev type events. Cause if you don't play with the Microsoft AI stuff. You may not know what cognitive services is, or you've heard of it, but you don't really know what's in there. So we'll do kind of a brief tour of, of what's in there. Um, so maybe if you don't want to play with language and speech, like we're going to talk about here, maybe you want to uh, play with vision or something like that. So I'll kind of go through what it is, why it is. Uh, and then the language API is where we're going to spend most of our time and, and how it can intertwine with speech. They're very similar. Um, and so we've got some demos we're going to walk through there. And then where I want to wrap this up is, you know, what can companies do with this stuff? And by saying that, I really mean, what can you do with it? You know, what can you do with it as a side project to show off to somebody? Uh, what can you do with it at work to impress your boss or help solve some problem that you have? So there's just, there's a handful of examples, things that I've seen, things that I've done. And we'll kind of walk through those. Um, happy to take questions in the chat at any point. I know this medium is is hard. Um, it's it's more fun for all of us, I think, when we can speak back and forth. But definitely, we'll take 
questions, feedback, whatever else. Um, if there's things you'd like to see improve about this talk, let me know. I always want it to be better for the next group. Um, I'll, I'll steal a joke from my old boss that uh, if you want to give me positive feedback, go ahead and tweet that. If you want to give me negative feedback, email that just to me and don't tell anybody else. But in all seriousness, we always want these to be better. And so if there's things you'd like to see that you haven't seen tonight, let me know. All right. Well, what is this stuff? So this slide is going to be vague and marketing-y, and there's a reason for that. So I started working with Cognitive Services almost exactly three years ago now. And I'll just tell a brief story about what kind of pulled me into it. Um, I didn't, I, you know, I think AI stuff is cool. I had no particular interest in it. The job I had at the time, we were not, that wasn't a consulting offering we had. Um, but I had uh, a boss of mine that had gone on to Microsoft and was doing some stuff with the cognitive services language API with do, doing sentiment analysis on tweets, basically scoring how positive or negative they might be. And we'll talk about this in more depth later. He was doing that and trying to predict uh, basically superhero movie box offices based off that. And if you want to find him online, he's at SQL Balls. Uh, Brad Balls is his name. And so I had read a blog of his just randomly because he posted it. And then I was listening to a soccer podcast that I like. So completely divorced from day job stuff. And the soccer podcast, there was a team, they covered the English top flight mostly. And there was a team that was running away with the season. They had won like the first 10 games. They were sure they were going to win the title. And they jokingly said they were going to cancel the podcast because there's no point in talking about anything that happens on, on the field because one team had ruined the whole year. Um, what they said, what the only thing that really matters is how the supporters and fans feel about their club. And I happen to be driving to a client to do a very DBA focused consulting gig, listen to that podcast and kind of put the two things together that I had ingested independently and said, you know, I think that cognitive services stuff that Brad wrote about, maybe I can do something with this. So the way I've gotten into this has nothing to do with work. It was just kind of staying interested in tech. And um, that's where Twitter and stuff really comes in handy. I know with politics and all this stuff now, it's uh, Twitter can be an absolute cesspool. Make heavy use of the mute function. Make heavy use of the block function. Because the Microsoft tech stuff, whether it's AI focused, whether it's data focused, there's no better place to get information. You know, I've gotten to speak at two past summits on this stuff. Um, I'll have a book coming out next year with some friends of mine all on this stuff. And it's all because I happen to read that blog, listen to that podcast and say, I should go play with this. So my hope is that's kind of a long winded version of saying, I hope you come away from this and want to go play with stuff too. And that similarly cool stuff happens to you as well. But anyway, so like I said, this looks marketing and vague. And the reason is because when I started working on this stuff three years ago, uh, it didn't do a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show you. Uh, so they've left the description and you see it in that top sub bullet there, sets of machine learning algorithms to solve problems. Like, what does that mean? It doesn't really mean anything. Uh, what, you know, what can you do with it? Well, you can call it with code, you can call it with bots, and we'll talk more about those different methods and things like that. But what's interesting about this stuff is once you get into it and kind of start keeping up with it, they add new functionality so often that, you know, there's a lot of things when I set up the original thing for the podcast to rank the teams by the feelings of their fans. And I was like, oh, you know, it'd be cool if it did this. A couple of years later, it does that. And so they leave the descriptions vague. They leave them marketing-y sounding because they keep adding to the suite so much. So it's by no means fixed. Um, so how do you use them? So we talked about their descriptions vague here. You, they can be consumed via standard REST calls. So if you want to, you know, if you're more comfortable on, on the app dev side of the fence and you want to use C Sharp or Python or something like that, you can consume them all that way. If you're not at a stage where you feel like writing code or, or don't know a language well enough where you think you can dive into this, there are no code and low code ways to 
interact with these as well. And I'm going to show you uh, three of those. So you can use Azure Logic Apps, uh, Q&A Maker, things like that. And that's you don't have to write any code to play with those. You just kind of have to drag and drop some stuff. If you want to learn to call them, I, I, I will give the Microsoft Docs team a call out here. So I have the link to the documentation here for a reason, and it's because it's excellent. Um, it's You won't often hear me say that about Docs pages, um, but Microsoft's really come a long way, even on the SQL Server and data side as well. But the documentation for this stuff is fantastic. So if you walk away from here and you're like, well, I really want to dive into the methods I call parameters I use, all that. Not only is the documentation very thorough, there are tons of examples that really help somebody getting started. And in fact, one of the demos I'll show you is basically built off a quick start example. And, and I end with that to show you how easy it is to get plugged into this, even if you're in an area where you're not the most comfortable. So. So we know it's a set of APIs. We know it's machine learning algorithms. Let's learn a little bit more than that because that's super vague. Um, so the list of APIs stands at five right now. Now there's many things you can call and use underneath these, but they kind of fall into five classes. So we've got vision. Um, so if you've ever seen demos where uh, along the lines like facial recognition or you've got static cameras somewhere and it's trying to analyze is there a thunderstorm coming is there a flood happening something like that that's using vision to do that um, a lot of the things i'm going to show you especially when we get to the code part a lot of the apis have it in common to a certain extent and so i you'll be kind of one step closer to getting to play with that if you're like well that sounds cool but you're not going to talk about that hang out until the end and we'll get to some stuff that that's even going to help you there even though we're not going to look at vision uh speech and language for me kind of go together we're going to focus on language here tonight but i'm going to mention a few times where you can tie speech right into this stuff and again as we get as we start to see how to use the apis in logic apps and more so in code you're going to understand how to call these speech and language have a lot of stuff in common because what it really is is kind of the audio version of language obviously so a lot of the calls we're going to talk about with translation and things like that very speech similar right in between the two so if you walk away from this and say i just want to play with speech you're gonna have a lot of the tools to do that uh these last two less interesting for me if i'm being honest but very interesting to some folks so we've got what's called decision um the names on a couple of these have changed frequently <laughs> um Last I checked yesterday, it's it's still called that. But decision is really kind of an enhanced uh, bingle foo, if you will, for academic research and things like that. That maybe Google and Bing itself don't always, you know, find the right way. Um, so they've built some ML into that. And along kind of those same lines is there's some things you can do with web search, uh, particularly tied into bots and things like that. And it, it applies ML to those searches and in theory makes them a little smarter and make sure they're returning more useful things to you. But as I've mentioned a couple times, language API is where we're gonna be for the night with a few hat tips towards speech. Because honestly, most communication starts either speech or text, right? As, especially in our current world. Um, what you're gonna find in all of these and what you're gonna see at the end, so I don't wanna spend 30 minutes like character by character, here's what the JSON document looks like for this because you'd all log off and leave. Um, but the majority of the payloads that go back and forth are JSON, so they're pretty human readable. So even if you're like, ah, I'm not much of a developer at all, you're gonna be able to understand what you're getting back and what, what you're sending. Um, so let's dive into the language API, unless there are any questions about that. Okay, cool. Ah, okay. All right. I, I will throw that in there. All right. So, <laughs> no worries. Uh, so what is the language API? 
So what does Microsoft call it? Again, we're getting marketing -y and vague here, but I actually like this one better than the other one. So like it says there, it increases your app's ability to read, comprehend, and enrich written text. And in the demos, we're kind of going to work in reverse order of what that statement says. Uh, what do I call it? Basically, it helps us in any apps, whether we're developing them, interacting with them, adding to them, suggesting changes, whatever we're at. It helps us talk to users, talk to customers, people that might be customers, might be users, and it helps reach people where they're at. It helps make experiences more accessible. Um, it, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff it does here, and it gives us more data about people's interactions with our site, with our product, with our brand, or with just us. Um, so is it just one API? No, you'll hear me kind of go back and forth and talk about cognitive services APIs and language API. It's not, there's a lot of APIs in here. Uh, it looks like the marketing folks have taken a call, the cognitive services suite, uh, which does make more sense as we start to have some things that while you can interact with them via calls from code, you really don't have to, and it's actually um, probably not the best way to do it. So cognitive services suite is probably what we ought to be calling it. But there's, as we've seen, there's a lot of stuff that falls underneath this. So here's the five places where we're going to focus our attention tonight, and we're going to demo four of them. So where we start here is these are just the highlights that I'm, I'm not covering exhaustively everything it can do because it's capable of a ton of stuff. Um, we're going to start with immersive reader because for me that's kind of interesting because you know a lot of kind of the buzz around AI is well, we're going to use it to make a ton of money or we're going to use it to mine data for possibly nefarious things right people are scared of it reader is a use of it that's doing good for for a lot of folks so we're going to start there and then we're going to dive into what I would call kind of the conversational part of this Luis and Q&A maker are related and I kind of demo those in reverse order because I want to show you the strengths of one versus the other um, text analytics is where we're going to talk Twitter sentiment analysis and some other things we can do with text uh, that help you analyze kind of what what people are stating online or on forums you support or something like that about things uh, so it can be very helpful especially in a corporate environment and we'll talk more about that there and at the end we will show what i think is the coolest thing and we're going to translate text back and forth between a few different languages and show how easy that is all right so like i said we'll start with reader because for me it it's interesting because this it all you're doing is helping people here. There's nothing like, well, I'm going to apply this and increase my revenue or do whatever. You're just helping folks. And for people that have come to this session that are in the uh, educational world, um, this, this has a lot of possible applications here. So here, you've kind of heard me drag on their marketing -y descriptions here a bit. Here's one I really like, and I won't read the bullet out to you, but you can see it in that first bullet there. Helps emerging readers, blah, blah, blah. And so what it does is it helps you know either people that are learning to read or learning the language they're trying to read or people with learning differences. It helps them absorb the written content on your site. So after I've kind of set this up and said this is AI for good, there are some possible applications here where if you make it more accessible for people with different abilities to understand the written language on your site and all that, if you're selling a product, they're going to be much more inclined to buy your product if, if you use some of these sorts of things. But we're not going to focus on that ability here. I'm going to go through basically what those six bullets are. And for me, this is kind of the highlights of what it can do. So a couple of these are obvious. You could change the viewable size of the text. It's great. Makes sense. Someone with vision differences um, that that's that's going to be a real help for them without having to have a secondary app or something like that. For your emerging readers and language learners, uh, you can put up tooltip pictures. So you'll hover your mouse over a word and the picture comes up of whatever that might be. And obviously that helps them to go a little deeper into the language learning side. You can highlight nouns and verbs and kind of do a, like a bit of a sentence diagram sort of thing. It can read the content out loud. 
uh, for folks that aren't able to do that. It can display the syllables of words. So again, going back to somebody learning the language, whether as a second language or, or a first, that's going to help them visually show what they're trying to say. And what I think is really interesting here, and you're going to hear me hit this point a few different times, this uses the translator API, which we'll talk about at the end, to translate the content into another language and back. And all this stuff plays together pretty seamlessly. Now, I don't have a demo for this. And the reason is because the examples that Microsoft keeps on their site are, in my opinion, better than anything that I could build. And this talk is already a little tight for an hour. So I would invite you if you're like, oh, this sounds great. This can help at the school that I work at or a place I teach, or I just want to go see this. Um, I definitely invite you to go to the Cognitive Services site, pull up the page for this and look at the examples and demos that they have, because this does some really cool stuff that can help a lot, a lot of people. So now we've talked about happy, helpful stuff. Let's talk about stuff that to be honest, is we're mostly going to use to bring people in into a website or into kind of a, a product procurement experience, let's say, to use the longest words possible there. So LUIS stands for Language Understanding Intelligent Service. Does not really roll off the tongue, especially mine. So we're going to call it by its acronym instead. So what does it do before we take kind of a brief look at it? So what I'll say is if you go to a website and you see that kind of inordinately perky person that pops up in, in the bottom and says, how may I help you? Or it says, can I help you? I'm here to help. And it's 3 a.m. or something. That chatbot experience is probably running over the top of something like this, probably even this. So this is where the conversational you know, dialogue with your data element starts to come in is you can create conversational experiences that are going to give customers, users, whatever kind of what they want, and you, can, and you can kind of steer those. At its most basic level, what it does is it tries to determine the intent of the statement that came in. You know, I would like to buy a car, I would like to order a donut, whatever it may be. It tries to isolate the entities and other like types and things that you've detailed and described and figure out the interaction of all of those. And so it's basically, you are perpetually training an ML model under the covers, but it's got kind of a nice gooey wrapper over it, at least the part I'm going to show. It can be talked to via APIs as well. It returns a JSON object, just like I said, most of this does. And it provides pre-built models for like home automation and things like that. We'll take a brief look at a couple of those and allows you to create custom models as well. And you can build an app, like I said, using APIs or using the portal, which I've linked to here and which we're also about to have a look at. And I will tell you in advance, my models are crude because like I said, this is kind of a crash course. Um, and so what I want you to see is just we're going to touch the surface of a lot of stuff here, and hopefully you come away with something. And you're like, that is awesome. I, I want to go do more with that. So what I've done here is I built two fairly basic apps. And so let's look at the pre-built one first. So we've gone into an app, and like I said, intents and entities is where we're going to focus and these are the basic building blocks of what one of these models are. Um, and there are there are good presentations solely on this. Like my friend Sam Nazar, he's at SAMNASR on Twitter. Um, he does a great presentation that's that's really a deep dive into a Luis experience. So I would recommend that. Like if we get beyond this, and this was the part you thought was really interesting, and want to know more about that, Sam's content is is great. But let's see what one of these pre-built models looks like. So what they've done is they've pre-built something to make a restaurant reservation. And it has some of what you would expect it would have. And so we see we've got this list. We can change reservation. We can confirm if we're the restaurant. We can find it. So maybe you have staff interacting with this as well. Like Mr. Smith is here and he says there's four of them and I need to go find this and make sure that's right. And then what we've got here is you see it lists examples down the side. So change reservations, and it has examples that it, again, these are pre-built, but it could be pulling it in from a chat bot. 
experience. Um, you could, you know, I can type something here and even though it's pre-built, it will add mine to that. And then you can train that model against the stuff that it's ingesting to make it smarter and smarter and make that conversation better um, and more accurate and more attuned to what the user wants. And so we've got some things here, like I said, uh, so we've got entities here as well. So we've got restaurant reservation time and it's kind of calling these out because it is it, you know again it's using ml to kind of pick these out um and so let's go to entities and you'll see some of what we just saw except there's two different types uh and again i do want to point out these even though these are pre-built you can add to them so they're not contained and you're like well i really want it to do this you can do that you can customize these these are intended as a foundation. And uh, after this, we'll look at what some of the most popular ones are. So we see we've got two types here. So we have lists. So let's look at list first. We think we know what list is, right? Mm, we were probably right. And so like it says, it's a fixed closed set of related words. You can add synonyms as well. So maybe if your restaurant does breakfast and brunch, you would want those synonyms there to kind of guide people to, to the right menu or something like that. It also notes these are typically extracted by an exact text match. And you saw that in some of the examples before where somebody talked about having a reservation for lunch and it said, oh, that's meal type and here's lunch. Um, so we've got that we have, so no examples here, but we, we do have the ability to add them. And then again, you could train against those and make your model more responsive, smarter, all those sorts of things. Before we leave entities, I want to show you this other type though. So we've got list and we kind of guessed what that was and we were right. Then we have cuisine, which seems like it should be a list, right? So maybe it's a long list, but it's all the different types. So this is ML learn. So let's take a look at some examples here. And again, this is basically pre-built from interactions that people have had with these. And then some that I've kind of played with as I worked on things for this demo and, and the book as well. Uh, so we've got here sushi. It's picked that up and it's like, ah, that's a, that's a type, but it learned it basically from context clues to, to put it in kind of layman's terms. And so we've got Italian cuisine type. You know that that makes sense right uh tacos cuisine type so those sorts of things and then it's got those pre-built but again like i said you can add things to that and you can use this train button up here and you can test it now i'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of chat bots because there are great sessions of focus just on that and that really deserves its own uh session but what you can do is when you feel like you have these to a point where when you go to test and you say like, I would like to reserve a table for two for breakfast. All right. And so it, when you get it to the point where you're running it through tests and you feel like, like, all right, it's, I, it's isolating my intents, right? It's isolating my, my entities, right? I'm ready to wire this up to a chat bot then you can just go over here and you go to publish, you can publish that model out. Now that's pretty dry, so I'm not gonna show it, but there is a pretty easy way to publish these out so bots can interact with them. Uh, before we leave this part, let's go to the pre-built domains just to kind of show you. And this again, intertwines with a couple of the things we're gonna talk about later as well when we get to the text analytics stuff. So you've got some things, home automation, you know, turn light on, turn light off, restaurant reservation, we went over. To-do list, calendar, weather, things like that. Um, and so these you can add to your portal experience here. So you see like the one I looked at, I've added it. So you get the button to take it out, but you can add other ones as well and really make kind of a rich experience with that bot where it can draw on all of this stuff. Um, let's look at the custom one before we leave here. So, all right. So the custom one, this is not thorough at all. Like I said, it's extremely basic, but what I want to show you is what I built here. So I built something we've got in agree. So when somebody says like, yes, bot, you have told me the right thing. We've got greetings. 
so we can understand you know whether the person's playing with us or not they're trying to be friendly maybe they do think it's a real person back there and so you would want to classify some greetings on on the way in i've got none which uh to be honest the advice is kind of variable on this but um, I, I've read some examples and, and folks that have worked on this in more depth that say sometimes the training of the model gets a little better when you put some kind of nonsense in. And so I've got some nonsense here. Um, and then our final intent is really it's a made up donut shop, which upsets my family because when I was working on this, they're like, oh, we can order donuts. It's like, no, it's not wired up to a real shop. But we've got some examples here of what somebody might say to a bot. Let me have a donut. Can I get a single donut? Can I get one donut? So it's all kind of variations on I want a donut. And you'll see we've got the scores here from when I've trained before. Uh, so what I found interesting is before I ever trained this, the first test I threw at this was can I order a pizza? So every, there's nothing about pizza in here at all. I was like, well, I wonder what it's going to do. And I figured order. So if it's if it's focusing just on the text on, on the way in, I figured like order, it's going to be like, well, this is order donut because I see that word. I'm going to text match that word. It doesn't. It knows I said pizza. That's not donut. That has nothing like what I've got here. Um, and again, that was really before I trained the model at all. It was the first test I ever ran against it. So that's kind of interesting to me and contrast it with, Q&A maker, which we're going to see next, which you'll see where you can have a very rich conversational experience here, though not with what I've built. Uh, Q&A maker, the conversational experience is helpful, but not rich. So on that note, if there are no questions about this, let's pop back to the slides just for a bit. And we'll, so we left off, we talked about, and you can kind of see the elements of it there. And like I said, really any of these could be their own session. Luis is very much deserving of its own sessions. It's really cool. You can build a really rich experience in there. Q&A makers along the same lines. And the, when I, the first couple of times I started to put together this talk and do it in front of groups, I demoed them in the opposite order. But in my opinion, Q&A Maker makes more sense within the context of what I've just showed you and why there, why two offerings exist. So what I just showed you was we've built some entities, we've built some intents, we can throw like a web test thing kind of at it. It's like, oh, okay, I see that it's, you know, before I've even trained it, it kind of knows what it's doing. As I train it on a richer and richer data set, it's going to get smarter. That could be a fair amount of work. And we still haven't built our bot, right? So how do I do, you know, what do we do here? So Q&A Maker basically takes that experience, distills it, and makes it easier. And the demo I'm going to show you, um, I built this for a SQL Saturday at the start of, of the year. It took me 10 minutes to, to build, and I didn't know what I was doing. I was just kind of following the help on, on the screen and all that. I really just wanted to play with it. Um, so what does it do? You can judge based on the name. It's probably going to take questions in and give you answers back. Now, I say in the bullet there, serves information interactively. That's true. You can have a conversational element to it. Uh, and you'll see there's some boxes you can check and some data you can supply for like multi-turn conversations. But Luis, it, it, it's not smart on that same level. And the reason is because it's driving off knowledge basis so we're not building an ml model under the covers there's some of that at work uh, but it's it's a much simpler thing underneath and so what are these knowledge bases so they can be just about anything they could be an faq page on a site they could be tabs separated value file they'd be excel files word files pdf all sorts of things now i'll, I'll run you through those types um, during the demo so you're like all right you showed me Luis, we asked it a question. You're about to show me Q&A Maker. We're gonna ask it questions. What's the difference? Well, like I said, they are pretty similar. Q&A Maker is very much a fixed offering. So if you give it a really rich set of information, it's gonna be a better experience for your user. But really what it's meant to do is serve relatively simple answers to relatively simple questions. So let's take a look at that and hopefully 
uh, if you will kind of see what I mean there. Okay, so what we've got is I'm going to show you uh, my pre-built one first, and then towards the end, going back to the slides, I'll show you how you can create your own. So in an imaginary world where my wife would like to lavish me with gifts, uh, she has gone on the internet to look for um, to look for some awesome race car themed gift for me. And what she's run into, and let me go ahead and open up another tab here, is uh, what she's run into is a bot over the top of this knowledge base here. So let's take a look at what the contents of the knowledge base are uh, while our bot wakes up in the background here. So what we've got here is the knowledge base kind of looks like you were probably expecting. So we've got questions how, you know, this is a, basically a place uh, in Miami, oddly enough, even though I built the demo for a SQL Saturday in Ohio, um, you can go rent an exotic car for the day. So I don't know if this place is any good or not. I just used it as an example for this because it was a site with fast cars on it that had an FAQ page. Um, so if you go, let me know how it is, but I, I, I cannot vouch for it. But we've got question and answer pairs here, right? And so I talked about how you can add a follow-up prompt so you can get that multi-turn conversation a bit where you would want the bot to answer back uh, and maybe guide the conversation a certain way, guide them towards a certain product, something like that. Uh, but let's, let's talk to this bot and let's see what we can ask it. All right, so this is the bot I built, and you go to test in web chat. Now, if I showed you in channels here, there's actually a couple clicks through where it will give you iframe code to drop this bot on a site. So I am by no means a web developer at all. My gifts and talents don't lie in that area. Um, but I do know what an iframe is, and I could probably put one on a crude site. So just to kind of underscore how simple this this experience is kind of within the portal. You have almost everything you need to drop this onto a website you already have. So let's see if our bot wants to talk to us tonight. To be completely fair, sometimes this web chat can be a little bulky. So uh, let's see how fast can I go? And let's see if it'll give us the answer we want. And usually it takes, when you start accessing it first, it can take a few seconds. All right, so we asked it, how fast can I go? Seems a logical thing for a website to drive fast cars, right? So let's ask it a direct question. So that came, all right. So we've seen, we've asked it a similar question there, right? But we got one useless answer and one useful but brief answer. So let's let's do another take on this and I'll, then I'll kind of show you how you can make this experience better without doing the Luis thing, which is gonna take a lot more time, but is much richer. So can I bring guests? You know, if if I'm going to get this cool gift, I want my buddies to come along too and join it. Yes, guests are free to join. Fantastic. But let's say I hadn't asked, can I bring guests? I had asked, can I bring other people? Which if, if you're talking to a human, we're mostly going to understand that means basically the same thing. It gave me a different answer. And... The reason is, is because it's doing a lot of this almost on like pure text matching. So I've got other here. It says no other passengers are allowed to ride with you. So it is a slightly different question, but I think you can see where it's the, it's lack of flexibility comes from the restrictiveness of what's in the knowledge base. So we'll go back to the knowledge base. I showed you here. You'll see the source up here. So that little brief chat we had drives off there. FAQ site, which is right here. So how did I wire these up and kind of show you how we can talk to it? So let's go back. We're going to create a knowledge base. And I'll kind of briefly walk through this because there's definitely uh, several more things I want to show you. And we've got about 20-ish minutes to do so. Um, so you create a Q&A service in Azure. I will say the pricing for this, especially for playtime, is very modest. Mine's like a few cents a month. Um, so you do that here. Not going to walk you all the way through because a lot of this is really dry and just waiting for Azure to build stuff. Um, you then connect it to your knowledge base. And so this is where you would tell it, 
directory ID, subscription name, Q&A service you just did in step one, and language as well. So you can see where it supports chit chat, so that conversational back and forth, and then somewhere you're really maybe only extracting the questions that you get in. Um, we name our knowledge base here, obviously, and we populate it. So when I built that, I cut and paste this link here and said, I want to build it from here. Now, you heard me talk about multi-turn conversations and extraction a bit. If you have uh, a PDF or, or a Word doc or a website where there is kind of a richer conversation pattern in the questions and answers, you can switch this on and, and make that experience a little better. But for what I did, I didn't do this. Chit chat. So you can talk to these like if if for those of you with kids, um, uh, my kids love to ask Siri jokes and silly things, and you can do some of that here, and you can give it a personality that does that in there and kind of changes what it does if, if you want that experience to be a little friendlier. Um, but, you know, we can upload tons of different files here. You can see, like I said, TSV, PDF, doc, docx, XLSX, all that. We've told it what kind of personality we want to have. You click create here, and you're done. Um, and like I said, I built all this in about 10 minutes, really before I had done a lot of research into how the service even worked. I just kind of wanted to play with it. So on that note, we'll flip back to the slides. And are there any questions at this point? Okay. All right. So. This is all, I wouldn't say my favorite part because I think there's cool things. It's fun to talk about all these. Um, text analytics is kind of close to my heart though. Cause like I said, it's what got me out of, not out of, but um, you know, took me from kind of a pure data thing and open up the world of what AI can do now for the dumbest reason possible to get on a soccer podcast, I thought was fun. Um, but you know, even though that was a dumb reason, like I said, it's, it's, it's exposed me to some cool stuff, some cool things, being able to talk to you folks here. So let's dive into what text analytics can do. Um, and this one, I would say leans a bit heavy on the, on the corporate -y, marketing -y stuff, um, because that's where I find it most useful. And actually the first session I ever built on this stuff was text analytics basically to help you at your job. And it's a lot of this stuff we're going to talk about here. So key phrase extraction, bullet one. When you see like a word cloud visual and things like that, it's driving off of that. Um, it's, it's using, you know, that power here to say, well, I see the phrase good job, you know, this many times. And I see the phrase bad job that many times. So good job shows up this big, bad job shows up this big. Um, it's also like if you go to Yelp or similar like restaurant uh, or establishment review sites and like for restaurants, it says amazing sauce, great pasta, whatever. It's using key phrase extraction to pull that out. So if you'd like to add that either to your website or another place that uh, this could be very useful is let's say you maintain like a support forum. So you're, you release software products or hardware like bikes or something like that. And you've released a new version of whatever it is you do. You could build a word cloud visual because you can stream text analytics output into power BI as well. Um, and I'll show you kind of how to wire that up later. Um, but you can stream that data over there and you could have an ongoing visual that day via the streaming data set where you know new version of product comes out and if the word cloud is full of curse words and this is awful and whatever then you know it's gone horribly wrong and you need to react to that quick and you don't need a person sitting there reading every post to know that you can let this do the work for you so you can talk to your data that your users, customers, whatever, throwing in there and learn some things and get it to talk back to you. And maybe you need to go talk to them. Uh, so key phrase extraction is kind of what it sounds like, uh, language detection along those same lines. Um, it's part of text analytics. It's part of translator as well. It does exactly what you think. It looks at a piece of text and says, I think this is English. I think this is German. I think it's whatever. Um, so named entity recognition can be a little bit confusing. And so, and even when you go read the docs for it, as much as I've bragged on the docs site, 
um, the the documentation for the actual API itself is fairly clear. The examples and kind of uh, pros description of it are confusing. So I'll try to kind of untangle these here and hopefully I do a good job. Please let me know if not. So named entity recognition actually incorporates both that as a feature and entity linking as well. So entity linking goes back to something where I said immersive reader does some things and we talked about Luis doing some things, having an understanding of calendars, things like that. We're bringing that together a little bit here. So when you go into, whether it's an application experience, whether it's a chat bot, website, whatever, and you see where like time ranges are highlighted and you can add an appointment there or a location is highlighted and it directs you to like the city's tourism site or something like that. Entity linking is likely powering something like that. Now what named entity recognition tries to do within kind of that same name of feature, even though it incorporates two different things, as Microsoft says, it identifies and disambiguates the entity or the, the identity of an entity found in text. And the kind of the best example I can think of is you've got Venus the planet and Venus the goddess, and it's going to use context clues in layman's terms, ML in nerd terms, to disambiguate those and say, well, based on the context it's in, I then now am going to link to an article about uh, Venus the goddess or Venus the planet or whatever. So that's, uh, in a broad sense, three of the interesting things that text analytics can do. It brings us to sentiment analysis, which like I said, is what brought me into this world. Um, and I think this is really interesting and it lends itself nicely to a demo as well. So let's go ahead and pop over to that. So what is sentiment analysis? I mentioned it briefly earlier. At its basic level, it is taking a piece of text and I've used tweets both because it, it fit the soccer mood table well, um, but also it was easily consumable pieces of text back when this was uh, younger and, and not quite as powerful as it was. But it scores it based on what it sees, zero to one. Zero is the most negative score, one is the most positive. In my experience of running this against millions and millions and millions of tweets, because English soccer clubs generate a lot of Twitter traffic, um, you'll never see a zero, you'll never see a one. And what you'll see is a very long decimal score, usually. The only time you'll see something short, like a 0 0.5, is uh, if it doesn't know what to do. So if the tweet is just a GIF or an image or something like that, and it, you feed that through this, it's like there's no text, 0 0.5, I don't know. Um, so we'll kind of walk through, let's walk through how we pull one of these in, and I'll show you what the output is. So this is where I'll take another uh, detour that's quite brief, but important. If you're not familiar with Azure Logic Apps at all, I first learned about them, again, basically trying to build that mood table. Um, that was how my friend Brad had built stuff. I didn't know what Logic Apps were, so I started building this stuff and saying, like, all right, well, he used Logic Apps to ingest tweets, so I'm going to do the same thing. So what are these things? So what I, what I call them is they're event-driven workflow containers, and they're not containers in the Kubernetes Docker sense. They're containers in like the Tupperware sense where they, they're they event driven. So something has to happen um, to spin one up. And then they're kind of serverless and stateless that we all know they're running on hardware some, somewhere. And then a workflow happens from there. So it's like when a thing happens, do this workflow after this. And we're doing something silly here with tweets and text and all that. You can do this with ServiceNow tickets. You can do it with social media posts from other platforms. There's SAP integrations and all this. So what it starts with is a connector and a trigger. And so this is the Twitter connector. I think there's almost, or maybe even beyond 300 plus of these now. So like I said, any enterprise platform you can think of, and just about any social media platform you can think of, there's a first party connector for it. And there's also some third party ones as well. I used one that's straight out. 
out of the box that I want this workflow to kick off when a new tweet is posted with a particular bit of text in it. And so obviously this is not one of the English soccer ones because this one's searching for dog. But what happens here is this, is when there's a new tweet posted, you can schedule these to run. Uh, and if you want to have a kind of a, a deep dive into that, uh, go to my blog, SQL at speed.com, search for the words deep dive, and you'll find the post when I built this mood table that's got all the kind of gory details of what I did, how I scheduled it and all that. Um, but so what I've got here is this, and I've, I've, I've left my mouse over it. So you can search for terms in quotes. If it's more of a phrase, you can search for a hashtag. Fun fact, when I actually built uh, the original thing, you couldn't search for hashtags. It, it didn't support the hashtag character. It does now. Um, you can search for particular handles and words. So, you know, we're searching for dog here. And now we get to how often do you want to check for items? And I mentioned scheduling earlier for a good reason. <laughs> so the first match weekend that I ran the soccer mood table, there were 10 full matches on a Saturday. So 20 clubs. I had talked to the podcast guys um, and they were like, yeah, we're going to run it. And like I said, it, it's a pretty popular podcast. So I was pretty excited. And we had talked about how much data they wanted. And they said, well, just run it seven times during the match. So basically every 15 minutes, these are scheduled to wake up. They go search Twitter for stuff. And I had my interval there set to 15 minutes. And the document still says that this is the interval it will check for items. And the friendly description here still says, how often do you want to check for items? What I learned that night because I started everything, it was working great. I could see I was getting tweets. There was data going into the database, which we'll look at that here in a second. It was working fine. I looked at the end of the night and realized I had incurred over $700 of charges across you know, 22 million tweets or something trying to score these. And I could see they had run forever. My logic apps never died. They ran for all match, all matches, every match before they finally died. And some of them still didn't die because for the bigger clubs, people kept tweeting into the evening. So why did that happen? Well, long story short, this lies. So where it says how often you want to check for items, that's not how often it does. So if you if you're searching common text, so if you want to play with this and it's like dog or puppy or NFL or something like that, something that's bound to be on Twitter a lot. If it always, if it's always finding an occurrence of the text, the logic apps will never shut down and this clock will never restart. So it's important to schedule these. There's a variety of ways you can do that. And, and I'd be happy to talk more about those offline. Uh, but if you're playing with these, either use very strict terms um, or uh, schedule them because it, it now, the happy ending to that is Azure support refunded my money, uh, which because they said like, oh, you know, it doesn't work like it's supposed to or like it says it does, uh, but they haven't changed the docs yet. So anyway, so this happens. So when this is running, it sees a tweet and with a search text dog and then it comes down here and then here is where you can insert a new step. So I added this step here. And this is our detect sentiment step. So what I did before this and kind of the TV cooking show pre-bake thing is I've provisioned a text analytics resource within Azure. And again, if you go to that deep dive post on my blog, you'll see how to do that. It makes for a lousy demo, which is why it's on, on the blog with screenshots and all that. But I want you to understand kind of how we got to that point. So we've got this here. And when I click here, you'll see this content here and what this is so it says dynamic content and what this is is all of the data set you get out of here and then i could pull whatever text in there now i just want to score the text of the tweet so that's what happened and that's what we did now in this version of this logic app it actually did two things so it would insert a row in an azure sql database and it would go to a power bi streaming data set as well this is for a project I actually did a couple of years ago. That streaming data set and workspace is no longer active. So that's that's the warning there. Um, but I do want you to understand that if Power BI is your thing, um, you can stream to that as well and would be happy to chat more about that too. So 
we've gotten down to the database here. We've got some tweet. What does the database record look like? So what it looks like is this, and this is actually a side project I had with a friend of mine a couple of years ago. Um, so if you follow MLS, you're going to be familiar with the club that we're talking about here. But I want to show you what a positive and negative tweet looks like. And I also want to apologize if there's any bad language in these lists. This was raw data from a match, and it was a season they weren't very good. Um, so if you see a curse word, sorry. Um, so what we've got here, we're going to start out with a happy one. There probably aren't curse words here. So this is somebody who said, this is my first soccer pro game. I enjoyed it so much. Thanks, blah, blah, blah. Well, that seems like a positive tweet, right? So what's our score? So, and I'll zoom in on this. So what text analytics outputs and feeds to the rest of the Logic app is, is that score. And so that's a positive score. Like I said, it's not going to be above 1.0. Um, so we've got 0 0.9899. That's great, right? So let's have a look at what a negative tweet is. And so we've talked about how there's a lot of intelligence in some of these things. So we've got, this guy says, it's frustrating to see so many calls missed on a certain player they had because he doesn't go down every time he's kicked. So there's not, there's not violent language in there. He's not swearing. He's not saying, I'm so mad. I'm so angry. It's frustrating, right? So how does it score that? 0.001. So we got a pretty wide disparity between those two. Now, what was interesting is the more and more I ran this, there's a lot of stuff in in the middle. And it's been really interesting now, three years on, to see how much the the machine learning behind the scenes has matured and gotten smarter. Um, you know, especially with regard to like sarcasm and things like that. So you're gonna get a really good picture of what people intend by whatever chunk of text you're trying to analyze. Um, so let's go back to the slides here. One other thing I want to leave you with, though, is so what I talked about was version 2.0 of the text analytics API. We're now on version three. It does all the stuff I just showed you. But if you're like, well, that seems really useful, but I want to run that against message board posts or Facebook posts or something like that. And, you know, against a score for like a thousand word thing is not relevant to me. When you get to version three of the API, what it gives back to you, and you have this option depending on how you call it, is it will it will kind of give you a heat map by section. It'll say like, well, the first 33% were very positive, and then the middle 50% was moderate, and then the last, you know, 17% very negative or something like that. So if you find it easier to consume it and kind of analyze it that way. That's um, version 3.0 of the API is what you'll want to use. And, and that's uh, been running for several months. So let's wrap up with Translator because I think this is pretty cool. So what can you do with it? Not a surprise. You can translate text. Um, there are two types of translation that it does. So you've got what I have on the slide here in MT, and that's using neural networks basically to do this. And if you dive deep into stuff that I was not a good enough computer science student to really understand, um, this makes more precise translations faster. And so the majority of, and I think we're up to 61 or 62 languages that it can translate back and forth from, the majority of these use NMT and the goal is for all of them to use it. There are still some that use what's called SMT, which is a statistical machine translation, which is, you know, let's say more math based, a little less intelligence based, though it's all pretty smart. Um, that's less precise translation, what can also take longer as well. They do keep a list updated on the documentation site on which languages use which type. So if you're in an environment where that, you know, every millisecond counts and you want to know if a language you think you're going to need to use does it the really fast way or the pretty fast way, you can go check the docs page there. So it does translation under the covers. It's doing two different types. It also can convert from one alphabet to another. And I don't, un unfortunately, with the demo I want to show you, I don't have a good way to show that. But let's say you're going from Hindi to German or something like that. You can transliterate text as well, which can be really powerful and i've actually seen this demonstrated with the speech api as well where you've got 
a video readout of the transliterated text coming back and let's say a Hindi response coming back to German that was spoken in. So unfortunately with this medium, that that's a demo I want to show. There, there's not a good way to see it. Um, but I want you to know that that possibility exists. Uh, we talked about language detection. Obviously, it can do that. You can look up word translations as well. We're focused on text, but all the stuff I just told you, and we even talked about speech, um, There, there's a speech API that handles all that. You could do a very similar session to what I've just done with that, and next year, I, I hope to do that. But what I want to show you is how all these APIs, but particularly language and sp speech, play together really, really well. Um, and they can do some really powerful, cool stuff. Uh, so let's wrap this up with a demo. So what I've got is a simple C Sharp console app here. And I'm just going to run it. Like I said, I knew I can do just enough app dev to be dangerous, but that's about it. And let's say thanks for letting me present my session to you. Type that. Magic. Not really. Uh, so let's talk about what this is. So what we've got here, and I'll go ahead and zoom in on it, is so translated to English, which it's not doing that. So you see confidence score of one. It's sure that I sent it English. So one of the outputs I have is how confident is it in what it thinks it got? So it's really sure that that's English and that's good because it's right. Underneath that, it's translated to Italian, which I do not speak. So I assume it's done that right. It's translated to German, which I do speak a little of. That looks right to me. And just for a fun kind of nerd throw in, it does Klingon as well. And there are actually two types of Klingon translations supported by Cognitive services. So if that's your thing, uh, you can even use it to do some Star Trek stuff. But what I want to call your attention to here before we leave this screen is what came back. So we've got our list of translations here and you see it there and we've got text and then it says, thanks for letting me present. We've got the two, which is the language that you've translated to. And then, so we've got in a we've got a JSON array there of those things. So how did how did we then get it down here? Something where you could show in an app or on a screen or something like that. And so we're going to wrap up with a brief walkthrough. We're not going to go line by line here at all of what's in this code. And there's a couple of things I want to pull out. So I mentioned that we're on version 3.0 of text analytics, and and I think almost all the cognitive services APIs now. Surely most of them. So here's the end of our URL endpoint. So we've all. Oh yeah yeah. All right. So we've already provisioned a translator endpoint. That's the one we're using. Again, it makes for a terrible demo, so I don't show that because I want you to see the good stuff. And so we've got a URL there that shows API version 3.0, and then all those strings I put on the end, translate it to English, Italian, German, and Klingon. And so it says type the phrase you want to translate, console, so we read that in basic stuff, right? A couple other things I want to point out. So this is called route. So let's take a look at this line where the translation request actually goes. So it's asynchronous. And what it sends is the subscription key and endpoint, which if you look right below there, I have set up environment variables to do that. Microsoft has an excellent concise document on how to do that. It's very dry, so I don't show it, but I do want to point that out. For safety reasons, you should do that. And in a demo, if I had my subscription key and endpoint in clear text down there, it would work. But you'd also then all have it and could use my endpoint and make me spend all of my Azure money trying to play with your stuff. So if you're doing this in a corporate environment or, or just to be secure, if you're gonna share the code out on GitHub or anything like that, uh, put your subscription key and endpoint in local environment variables. And so it takes those two things and basically says, the subscription key is like the password. So what's the password? Where am I headed? And then the route, which is the end of the, the end of, the API call, and then the text to translate, which it read off the console. Some magic happens, some other code magic happens. As my kids would say, blah, 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 blah. And we get down to here, 
And all we've done to get that out of there is let's focus on translation result. So like it says, we're basically using standard.net stuff here that you can easily look up. And like I said, this is a twist on actually one of the quick start examples they had on, on the docs page at, at the start of the year. So what we're doing is we're deserializing the JSON and displaying it and saying, here's the language I think it is, and here's all the translations you asked for. So hopefully you can see, even though this looks like big, scary code, it's not big, scary code. And this stuff, it, it's easy to understand what comes back, and it's easy to understand kind of how to talk back and forth. That's just one example. But if you take away from this and you start interacting with language or speech or whatever, all of these calls are going to look very similar to you in a lot of ways. So back to the slides for a wrap up. And then off we go. So what can companies do with this stuff? So Immersive Reader, we kind of talked about. Um, and like I said, it's really cool. And it, Microsoft has this kind of AI for good thing, and it very much fits in that. Luis, we talked about it. Primarily to me, I think it's a customer interaction thing. There are some people that have done really cool things with the home automation pre-built domain. And, and, and if that's your thing, you could certainly play with it. But I think for a broader audience, customer interaction, that conversational chatbot type thing kind of makes sense. Q&A maker. So here's one. So you may be sitting out there and you're like, I'm a DBA or I'm a sysadmin or whatever. I don't really care about this stuff. Q&A maker, I think, could be hugely useful for you. So thinking back to when I was a DBA, a lot of the questions I would get is like, well, what server does this database live on? And which environment is this? And what customer is on blah, 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 SQL 05 or something like that? Well, those kind of throw you off your game if you're trying to do some dev work or performance tuning or whatever, and somebody hits you with an IM or an email, you got to go answer them, then your focus is thrown off. You could build that list. You could put Q&A Maker over the top. Like I said, I built Q&A Maker and that bot in probably 10 to 12 minutes. And then you can tell them, go talk to my bot, and it's going to give you everything you need. And you can enrich that experience for them too because then you can actually go into the logs and see what you're getting and maybe they're asking the question not quite in the way you thought and you can make it better so they'll bug you even less and less so i think that could be pretty cool even if nothing else in here has piqued your interest if you're in a position where somebody asks you a lot of the same or similar questions over and over again perfect text analytics we've talked about that and i'll just kind of highlight um, like I said, I have a whole session on this, but if you work for a company with any online presence at all, there are a multitude of examples where companies either intentionally or unintentionally have really stepped into some serious issues online that yeah, caused financial penalties, bad press, downward, you know, downturn in sales, all those sorts of things. Sentiment analysis, having the ability to quickly process that, see that basically people are upset with you online and then react to that can be massively helpful. We talked about what we can do with key phrase extraction and some of those other ser services and how they can help in like message boards, knowledge bases, things like that. And then translator text is where we ended up with. So again, you can give you the flexibility to talk back and forth to users in their native tongue. And the one kind of interesting twist I think on this is uh, I actually heard a story recently of, of somebody I know that works at a company that was localizing their application in, into Spanish. And what they did is they paid for six months of Spanish instruction for their customer support people who were then going to localize the app by hand. And none of them are native speakers. So there may be regional things they don't know about you know, all those sorts of things. And it's a tremendous amount of work. These people are, you know, doing online courses during the day and they're taking tests. You could feed all of the text from an app into a, an app, not much more complex than what I've built here and get 95% of that localization work done because it's going to do the translation for you. You'd still want a local speaker um, or a native speaker to review it to make sure that there aren't issues that it's not quite up to speed on, maybe slang terms, things like that. The bulk of your work is done and it's done quick. Um, they did not, they, I asked to help them and they said no. Uh, but I think 
that can be very helpful here. So that's it. Um, like I said, these are the ways to find me uh, as of October 19th. Uh, you can find me, well, as from now, but exclusively after October 19th, you can find me uh, matt at sql at speed.com. And again, going back to the sentiment analysis stuff, that deep dive is on, on my blog to search for deep dive. And it's very, very long and in-depth on, on how you can build some of the stuff that I just showed you. Any questions? Resources slide. Yeah. yeah. And that's actually got a. Yeah. Um, no, because it's in. Well, kind of. Yeah, kind of. I can do that. All right, and you should should be back to you. Will do. And I realized I forgot to say it after uh, after you asked me to, but subscribe and like. <laughs> I'm not used to saying that. And my kids are pretty sure I'm constructing a YouTube channel back in my office because of the cameras and lights anyway. So I guess maybe I should get used to saying that, huh? <laughs> uh, subscribe and like to the video. Great presentation here by Matt Gordon, covering interactive AI with Azure Cognitive Services and dialogue with data. You had an opportunity to see some fantastic examples and also how you can learn and get engaged on your journey here. So, um, Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. It was really cool covering the and intense too, because when you said about the building because how the service work, I feel yeah. that is such a fantastic tip to everyone so everyone can be familiar with the challenges and pitfalls there. Yeah, and you can go into great depth. Like I said, I was not a good enough comp sci student uh, to understand everything that all, all the white papers talk about. But what's cool is that Microsoft's pretty open about a lot of the stuff they're doing. So if, if you if you have that deeper kind of uh, academic knowledge you, you're after, there's going to be some stuff on, on the doc site for you as well. And it's good to know, as you said, that they have more of a complete documentation to the product you know good quality a lot of uh, great information there so that's very engaging there for newcomers and uh, of course those seasoned professionals should be able to work with the product exactly yeah and uh, also great that you're talking about the machine learning maturity as the product principally engaging these years uh, v3 uh, version 3 of the azure yeah. cognitive services very encouraging there yeah, yeah, it's it, it's always getting smarter, which is cool. Makes it fun, fun to work on. So, what are your uh, the pro, the parts uh, which technology you like the most? Primarily, more of the speech. Um. So, in the world we're all kind of living in now, and, and I'll actually have to stop here in a couple minutes. Um, Very well. In the world we're in now, I, the language API is more interesting to me because everybody's online, right? We're all doom scrolling on social media all the time so particularly if you're a company as dynamic as environments are on social media and you may your social media team may make a post that some people take offense to and all that i think the language api is really relevant right now um, speech is more fun to play with 
but you know it's one of those things where a lot it, it it's fun to do the translation and stuff like that but when you don't speak the other language it just sounds cool you're kind of assuming it works right uh okay. but but it does but it you know it, it's all fun ai is cool so i i hope people found something in there that they want to go play with very well thank you very much once again we really appreciate here at the Microsoft Data and AI South Florida. Folks, remember, description and contact information for Matt is just below in the description section. Information about the user group as well. Remember to subscribe to the channel, like the video, and drop your comment. We want to know what you think, and we will follow up on it. Any That's last funny. words here, Matt? No, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. And everybody stay safe and hopefully we'll all get to hang out in person soon. Very well. Bye for now. Day. Thank <laughs> you very much. You take care there. Once again, thank you very much. Make it a great day there. You as well. <laughs>